so I'm very happy to be here. Can you hear me uh, properly? It's okay. I'm, I don't have a very strong voice, but hopefully <laughs> it's going to be okay. Okay, so I'll just say a, a few words about myself. Ah, if I cannot, yeah, there you go. So I'm a biologist, as uh, David said. So I work on plants. I work on uh, plant shapes, plant uh, morphogenesis. But I, I won't tell you uh, anything about my work, actually. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm also coming here as, um, with an overhead, let's say, uh, as the head of the Michel Serre Institute, we, we, we st which is trying to connect humanity with uh, nature in some ways through the natural contract. So yeah, it's, a, it's a book from uh, Michel Serre that was quite uh, inspiring from the 90s. But anyway, I won't, I won't tell you much more than that uh, on who I am. I'm just here to give you um, just one idea. <laughs> okay, so uh, if you just take a step back and you look around you, what do you see? <laughs> what do you see around you? Usually what we see is a lot of control and a lot of optimization. Especially when you're in city, so I mean we're in Paris, but it could be anywhere. What you see around you is a lot of control, a lot of optimization, and a lot of performance. So this is particularly clear. Um, I'm going to shut down the sound here. <laughs> particularly clear in cities, of course, because we've optimized the way uh, pedestrians can walk, uh, cars, uh, well, living systems, and, uh, and everything. Okay, I'm recording. But this is true as, as well in uh, agriculture. So if you, uh, if you, if you look, uh, <laughs> if, you, if you look at, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a chicken farm, intensive in chicken farm. So this is definitely under control, under optimization, under high performance. And this is true also for the landscape. So if you look at the landscape, the landscape has been optimized for our needs. And so this is what I'd like to, uh, to criticize and to see what else can we imagine in, in this world. So maybe I need to define what I'm talking about. Uh, so I'm going to talk a lot about uh, performance. And so we, I, I need to define it. So at least we agree on the definition, at least for the, this course. <laughs> So performance is the sum of efficacy and efficiency. Efficacy is when you reach your goal and efficiency with the least amount of means possible. So when you perform, when you're performant, when you're efficient, if you, want, uh, you are reaching your goal with the least amount of means. That's uh, definitely, I mean, it's, it's a classic uh, definition. Huh? That's what you uh, learn in a management course, in a political science. I mean, it's a very generic uh, definition. So my question is, why is performance a problem? Why is performance a problem? So I'm going to give you uh, four arguments <laughs> against uh, performance. So the first one is this one, is that when we uh, do optimization, so when we optimize things, we increase performance, right? We increase the efficacy and we increase the efficiency. That's optimization. But when you do this, actually, you are weakening the system, always. So this is uh, no, just uh, an image, if you want. So that, that's the world. <laughs> that's the world. With a lot of uh, textile, of different texture, different colors. And so what humans, what we are doing, is that we are to re resolve some problems. We make them smaller. And then we resolve that small problem. So it's like putting a thread through uh, the eye of a needle, right? But when you do this, when you pull on that thread, you generate many knots elsewhere. And this is what really what we do. When we do optimization, usually we solve a small problem and we generate a lot more problems. So this is cl classic in uh, optimization. I just want to give you, uh, to really <laughs> be uh, forceful, an example of uh, counterproductivity, counterproductivity, uh, productive performance. It's the Sustainable uh, Developmental Goals. Uh, you see the SDGs, right? So you have 17 SDGs. So that means that we've taken the world and we've divided it in 17 different objectives. And so what happens when you have this type of uh, thinking is that you generate competition. You generate competition between objectives. So if I want to put all my energy on objective six to get clean water, I might never get to the objective <coughs> one, which is to get no poverty. So this is a bad design, if you want. This is actually an example where you, uh, you fragment the objectives and you try to solve one problem after another. So that doesn't work. And also there's one thing I'd like to underline is objective eight. Objective eight, there is the objective of economic growth in a world that is going to contract its economy in the 21st century, inevitably. 
So this is really completely uh, crazy <laughs> in some ways. So there's a lot, of a lot to say on SDGs. But anyway, so my, my point here is that optimization is a weakening force. The, sec the second point is on the rebound effect. So you probably have heard uh, this uh, before. Uh, rebound effect, so here I take the, my favorite example about uh, fridges. So fridges in the 1960s, uh, they, were very, uh, they were consuming a lot of energy, a lot of electricity. But they were not that uh, numerous. There was not so many fridges around, right? So what we've done is that we've improved the energy efficiency of fridges. And what happened? Uh, they became more attractive, cheaper. So we've multiplied the number of fridges. We made them uh, bigger. Now we have uh, connected fridges. Now we have uh, wine cellar. <laughs> so if you look at the population of fridges, it has increased a lot. And the consumption of energy because of fridges has increased. So energy efficiency in a reductionistic view of the world, like performances, is counterproductive. You always uh, consume more energy at the end. So that's the rebound effect. So there's rebound effect for fridges, but there's rebound effect for anything. Eh? It's true for, uh, for coal, for uh, petrol, for uh, yeah, uh, concentrated uh, detergent, right? You use uh, more uh, active uh, components uh, when you do this. Uh, the 5G, the digital world, I mean, uh, yeah, even like the palm oil, huh? you can see this as, um, as a rebound effect, right? We, you, uh, you grow crops that are more efficient per square meter. We produce more oil, more calorie. And by uh, doing this, uh, in the initially, huh, people said that this would avoid deforestation because you uh, increase the yield per square meter. You know, that's Norman Borlow's uh, theory, right? That you, you increase the yield per square meter and this is reducing <laughs> deforestation. And you saw what happened, right? So this has increased deforestation. Typical uh, rebound effect, right? It's uh, because it's so productive, it's more attractive, and we plant even more, we create new needs, and then we consume even more. Rebound effect, very prevalent. Third critic, and I think that's uh, it's almost my favorite one, <laughs> this one, it's uh, Goodhart Law. So what does Goodhart Law says? It says that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be reliable. So that means that the minute you put an indicator of performance somewhere, you will do anything to reach the maximum of performance. Anything. So here for uh, sports competition, it's almost like uh, too good to be true. So let's say you're, if you think uh, that you're a sports man or a sports woman, and your goal is to uh, be on top of the podium. What you can do sometimes is doping. So that means that your, your tool, your, your working tool is your body, and you're going to intoxicate yourself to be at the best position. See, or counterproductive can be performance, right? That's good art law. So there's uh, many examples, huh? Marco, Pan uh, Marco Pantani, I mean, the, and the, there's a lot of over aspects, huh? money laundering, uh, money betting. Uh, I mean, you, when you see sports competition, it's definitely uh, a case where you have an indicator of performance and the uh, impact is strong. I yeah. Understand the, money laundering. the money laundering, uh, so this is very well known. So if you have an indicator of performance, then you can bet money. Uh, for, uh, for sports, right, uh, for football and everything. But by betting money, you, this is a perfect way to do money laundering. There's uh, really billions that are laundered through uh, sports betting. And often it's not the most uh, visible one. So it's not like the European League or it's more like the secondary uh, sports competition that are a bit under the radar where there's a lot of money laundering. I think it was in, uh, in one year, I think it was in 2020, it was calculated that there was uh, 90 billion uh, dollars that were uh, laundered through sports competition only for football in Europe, 90 billion. Just to, so it's really massive, huh? and this is very toxic, of course. So this is for uh, sports, but any indicator of performance is uh, targeted by this. So you can think of uh, cramming before the exam, right, for education. So if you really want to get your exam, but maybe you will cram <laughs> before the exam. And so that way you will not learn anything, right? You will get your performance, but you won't learn anything. Right? Uh, the same goes for the Shanghai ranking. I mean, uh, it's really prevalent in uh, any field. I'm, I won't go too much into uh, details, but um, it's very prevalent. And the fourth argument against performance, of course, it's this one, the one that you are probably the most aware of, uh, the socio-ecological crisis. So when we think about it, the performance of uh, humans as a cost, and who is paying the cost of our performance? Ecosystems just to put it in a very simple way. So these are the four uh, subjects, resource scarcity, climate crisis, biodiversity collapse, and uh, global pollutions. 
So I won't go into uh, the details for this because I think you have already been uh, well <laughs> educated on this topic, so I won't tell you anything about all this. I just want to insist on one word, one word, it's the word fluctuation. Fluctuation. So if you want to summarize all the IPCC reports, all the IPBS reports, the IUCN report, the CIA report, the OECD reports, they are all saying the same thing. The 21st century will be turbulent, fluctuating. We are leaving the era of the mean and we are entering the era of the standard deviation. This is what is going to be our main topic for the 21st century. It's going to move a lot more. We are entering a changing world. Or if I say it in a different way, or excess of control, I uh, have made us lose control. We don't have the control on this, right? Obviously. Eh? So what do we do based on this? Right? So if we know now that we are entering a 21st century that is turbulent, what is our answer? Our answer so far, even more performance. Even more performance. And so this is really where you see that it's a cult. Huh? It's a cult <laughs> performance. <laughs> we can't get rid of it. We are just obsessed. We are drugged. We are addicted to performance. So here are some examples. Giant wind turbine, turbines. Uh, so these are like the, the ones that are um, offshore next to uh, the UK. Uh, and they are 260 meters high, uh, those giant wind turbines. Uh, the, uh, the, the wings, uh, they are uh, 100 meters long, they are made of uh, composites, so that's, uh, you can't recycle it, you can't repair it. Uh, the wood inside is balsa from equatorial forests, and there is a magnet that is 7 tons, and it's full of uh, rare earths. So you, you'll have to tell me what's ecological in that object. Huh? There's nothing about ecology in that thing, this is just productivism uh, at its best. It has completely lo lost the initial question, right? So it's completely performance that is uh, self-justifying. The same goes for the all-electric, right? So I mean, there are some very good projects in the all-electric, but uh, it's also uh, clumsy in the way we've designed it, right? So uh, for instance, a lot of it, the, the electric uh, world is dependent on uh, copper. And copper, if we look at the, the stock of copper, or like the, the, the peak of copper, it's uh, predicted to happen before tw between 2040 and 2075. So you know, like the, the copper peak, it's a bit like the, the, oil, the peak oil, huh? basically. It's the sa same idea, so it's when the consumption is not following the production, right? And so it's a really short-term thing. And so when you look at the all electric, so for instance, if you take uh, a thermic car, just a regular thermic car, uh, uh, or thermal engine car, uh, it's 20 kgs of copper for the electric circuit. But if you take an electric car, just a basic electric car, it's 80 kgs of copper. So it's four times more, four times more. And if you take a Tesla car, it's 240 kgs of copper. And you have to add a, a station, an electric station, that's another 100 kgs of copper. So you see, just by following the copper, we won't be able to replace all the cars with electric cars. So it's just not physically possible. <laughs> it's just uh, very badly uh, thought through. Anyway, so there, there's some good ideas in the all electric, but you see, it's not very uh, well done. And I'm only talking about copper here. Yeah? Of course, I could talk about cobalt, about lithium and all this, right? This is, yeah, it's in some ways a dead end. And this is another example, low energy bulbs. So these are the bulbs, you know, that are a bit like uh, twisted. So these are uh, bulbs that are consuming less energy. But to consume less energy, they have uh, mercury inside. So uh, it's really something great, right? So you, <laughs> you consume less energy, but you diffuse a pollutant in the homes of uh, everyone. Well, so you see, but that's where I say that it's really a cult performance. We are drug <laughs> performance. We can't mm -hmm. question it anymore. So I'm going to quote uh, Einstein. That's uh, the moment where you have to quote some, uh, someone. So this is Einstein, for instance. There are others, huh? but this one is uh, convenient. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So this, me this means that so far, we've, we know that performance is the cause of the problem that we've generated in the world, but not only in the ecology, also on the social world, huh? the burnout, huh? basically burnout of the humans, burnout of the ecosystems, right? This is the product of performance. And we want to solve it with even more performance. So you see, that's, that's where it's, you, you, we have to derail. Huh? So it's exactly like in a sect, you know, you have to <laughs> depart from, from this, right? You had a question or? No? Yeah. There is a way to define performance that is very important. So yeah. itself, 
Yeah, but performance is narrow by definition. Because if you, uh, if you want to be performing, you have to have a narrow objective to be very okay. efficacious and very efficient. Okay, you, you have to forget all the other objectives. To it's impossible to, yeah. Objective. Actually, you, you could think of uh, performance as something that is very inclusive, that includes many objectives, and that is also very long term. Yes. But then it's not performant anymore. What, what for, which for, which the, 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 the performance that would be very inclusive and very long term, that would take a long time to, uh, to be achieved. I call it robustness, <laughs> but not performance. Performance, by definition, is reductionistic. You narrow your vision of the world, and you just go like this, forgetting everything else. So that's why. We, we can't solve our problems by adding more performance on top of uh, problematic performance. Right? OK, yeah. Intelligence can be, yeah, but so it depends also on the diffusion, but yeah, that, that, could, that could be. It's also, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is the problem, right, that we have. So the question is, how do we get out of this? How do we inhabit a world that is fluctuating? That should be our question. That's really, it's, it's a scientific fact, right? So we are going to enter a world that is more turbulent. How do we leave a turbulent world? So maybe the simple, uh, so simple solution is just to look at the professionals of turbulence, right? Well, living beings, huh, of course. So living beings, they've lived in the world with a lot of fluctuations. Uh, you can uh, think of uh, several hundred million years ago, uh, the Earth was a snowball. Huh? It was almost completely frozen, right? Seven hundred million years ago. And there was life on, on the Earth. Huh? So the life actually went through uh, major fluctuations. Huh? So frozen or heat or uh, you know, storms and, and everything. And so here we have maybe a number of lessons from living beings to inhabit a fluctuating world, a world that is you know, moving a lot. So I'm going to give you uh, <laughs> this in a very simple way. It's only one or two things to, uh, to, um, to know. The first thing is that living beings, what they do is that they make a lot of interactions. And that's it. They make a lot of interactions. They do not optimize. They do make a lot of interactions. So here I take the example of uh, a tree in a forest. You probably all know this, huh? but this, is a, this is a classic in uh, symbiosis, right? So you take a tree in a forest, if you look at the roots, if you, you, know, if you scrap the soil and then you get to the roots, the roots are white usually, and they are white because they're full of, uh, of uh, fungi, right? It's, uh, it's covered with fungi. And uh, here if you have uh, this uh, network here from, um, uh, it's actually, uh, yeah, it's a scientific article where you see the red dots are plants and the other dots, the other color, are fungi, different species of fungi. And uh, what you see is that uh, one plant is interacting with a lot of different species of fungi, but those fungi are also connected to other plants that are connected to other fungi. So it's a, it's a huge network of interactions. And this is only the, tipping, uh, the tip of the iceberg, right? So because uh, this is only a few of the fungi species that the plant is interacting with. And it's, you don't have the bacteria here. So there are also millions of interactions on top of that, right? The microbiome, right? That we talk about uh, a lot more. This is not included here. So you see, that's what plants are doing. Or plants or living beings in general, they're making a lot of interactions. So see, that's not efficacious, not efficient. Huh? You just diversify a lot uh, and open-endedly, right? And what do they do with these uh, interactions? They build robustness. So robustness, oh, sorry. Yep. Uh, the, the, this network, uh, isn't it the most effective uh, system for trees to get food and, and water? And is it, isn't it the most efficient uh, living system? It's, a, it's not the most efficient, it's the most robust. It's the, mo the, the most efficient one is to take a tree and to put it in a basket of water. That's super efficient because then you have a massive amount of water that is going to go. But then, of course, you're going to kill your tree huh, if you do this. But it's very efficient in terms of water uh, you know, uh, absorption. Uh, that's, that's the best. But it's not the most robust, of course, because you need to have uh, always, I mean, you're dependent on that basin of uh, water, or that mega basin of water. Maybe. So uh, um, this is robust. This is where you know we, we need to. Um, I'm, uh, what I'm trying to do here is to uh, des desintoxic desintoxicate you and that me as well. Huh? 
for this tropism for efficiency and efficacy and performance. We always think that the performance solution is the right solution without uh, we're forgetting that actually it's much more complex than that, right? That you need to, uh, to open. And, uh, but yeah, I'm the same way, huh? so uh, I'm in the same <laughs> pool of, uh, I also um, I'm part of the problem as well. Huh? So what do we do with all these interactions? We do robustness. So robustness, I need to define it. So robustness is to maintain the stability of the system despite fluctuation. To maintain the stability of the system despite fluctuation. So that's in the short term. And in the long term, it's to maintain the viability of the system despite fluctuation. Or if you want, uh, robustness is the operational answer to fluctuations. There is no other answer than that. It's really the basic one. It's how you manage fluctuation. And so living beings, they've been selected over millions of years to be robust. That's what is selected during uh, Darwinian evolution. The question is, how, how, how do they manage to be robust? And this is, I think, the most interesting part, is robustness is built against performance. Against performance. You can't be our living beings. They are not trying to be performant and robust. They are robust because they are not performant. And so, yeah, I'm telling you this like in a very brutal way, <laughs> but uh, I, I said with a lot of confidence because uh, this was known in the ecosystems in the 1980s, for instance, but it was not known at the molecular level. But for the past 20 years, this has been demonstrated as well at the molecular scale. So now this is true from the molecule to the ecosystem. So this is the general principle of life, this robustness built against performance. So that's what we are going to dig into. So this is, if you want, the political program of a living being. That's what is really at the core of a living being. Inefficiency. So that means that uh, the living beings are wasting a lot of stuff. <laughs> they, are, they don't have a very good yields, and they don't have any objectives as well. So if you think of a Darwinian evolution, it's, uh, it's a blind evolution. It doesn't go anywhere, right? So you, there is a trajectory when you look back, but we don't know where it's going. Yes, so uh, maybe I can do it now if you want. So uh, robustness, as I said, right? it's to actually maybe I can uh, draw it like this. So robustness, let's say you, you have a trajectory that goes like this, right? So that's, that's your trajectory, let's say in time. And so robustness, it's to make sure that your margin are here, right? That you have enough room to be able to survive uh, whatever fluctuation you're experiencing uh, internally or externally, right? So that's that's uh, that's uh, robust, <laughs> or that's the robustness uh, boundaries, if you want. So you want to increase the boundaries so that to allow more um, trajectories, let's say. Resilience, resilience is a bit different. I'm going to try a different color, maybe green for resilience, or maybe yeah, green. I'll just get it. Uh, so resilience is is more uh, something like this. So you are like this, you fall. And then you go back, right? That's uh, that's the definition of resi or psychological resilience: is that you fall and you and you bounce back, if you want. So when you do this, uh, so I mean, th this could be uh, integrated within robustness. But you see, the problem here is that you um, it's a trajectory, so you can optimize the trajectory. So you can try to reduce, so you can try to do this instead, right? To fall uh, a little bit less, or to do it even more quickly, right? So that the time here is uh, is reduced, right? So this is a trajectory that you can optimize. Uh, so it's about returning to the initial state. Yeah, exactly. Um, returning to the initial state, that's resilience. And the problem with that is that it's completely uh, compatible with the ideo ideology of performance. Yeah, they want to make supply chain resilient. Exactly. Uh, in Japan, uh, so I'm going to give you the example of what uh, Thierry Ribot is uh, telling his, in his book. So in, uh, after Fukushima, so there is uh, national uh, politics of resilience in uh, Japan. And the, the sentence is, uh, if you don't want to be afraid of radioactivity, you need to expose yourself. That's resilience. So you see the problem. <laughs> so uh, socioeconomic resilience is a toxic thing, right? Because uh, what you are telling people is that they need to fall to bounce back. And it's your responsibility to bounce back. So resilience is really toxic in that sense, right? 
socio-ecological resilience is much more uh, lively than this, but the problem is right now, uh, resilience has taken this meaning, and so that's why I think we should avoid <laughs> using it. So robustness is really this, right? You increase the margin of error, uh, the, mar the margins, and then you can have uh, any trajectory. Okay, so robustness is built on yep, inefficiency or in living beings, uh, a lot of heterogeneity. So uh, if you think of uh, biodiversity, for instance, there's a lot of uh, heterogeneity in living systems. It's really like crazy, actually, the <laughs> level of heterogeneity. But you can also look at your hands. Huh? If you compare your, your right hand and your left hand, look at the lines in your hands, and, and they are different, right? They are not similar, right? So even in your hands, you have heterogeneity already. Randomness. Not from monest, randomness. So there's a lot of processes in biology that are random, but really random. Uh, there's an entire field of biology that is called stochastic biology, and it's only about random processes in biology. So there's a really a lot of random processes in biology. It's slow as well. There's a lot of slowness in uh, biological networks, a lot of delays. So each time you see something cycling in biology, like it could be uh, mon menstrual uh, cycles, uh, cell cycles, uh, circadian cycle, in any cycle, there is a delay. Eh? To be cycling, you need a delay. And so there are delays everywhere in uh, all the systems. It's also very redundant. There's a lot of redundancy in the biological system. So you can think of the number of uh, red blood cells you have in your body, right? It's uh, millions, right? So uh, take a tree. Huh? A tree, it's completely crazy the number of leaves there is on a tree, right? So all these systems are highly redundant. Huh? Gene networks, same, very redundant. It's very inconsistent. So there's a lot of incoherence. So this is probably the hardest to, uh, to get. Uh, if, you, if you look at gene networks, for instance, and if you follow one gene, you'll find that one gene is inhibiting and activating the same target. So if you want to have a mental image of a living being, it's like a, a car driver that is pushing on the brake and on the accelerator at the same time. So very incoherent, right? It's an internal contradiction. But this is actually making the system uh, fluctuate. Right? It's always uh, a little bit fluctuating, and that's the best shield against external fluctuation. You want to be in this situation where you're always like a little bit moving to be able to face external fluctuation. And all this is incomplete, of course, right? Because if it's complete, then it's dead. So as long as you're alive, you are still regenerating your cells, your organs, your tissues, and so you are not uh, complete. You're not finished, if you want. <laughs> So that's the big principles of life. And you see, it's only counter performances. And those counter performances, they add oil in the wheel, and this is what is adding robustness to the system. So just to give you uh, an example in biology, and then we'll switch to the social, uh, social field. So in, in bio just to give you two simple examples huh, in biology, body temperature. So body temperature, you know, 37 degrees. And uh, if I extract the proteins or the enzymes of your body uh, and I put them in tubes like this and I measure the activity of the enzymes, what I'll find is that usually the optimum of activity is around 40 degrees. 40 degrees. So there's three degree difference between the optimum and our body temperature. So that means that at 37 degrees, our body is functioning okay. I would say it's like, you know, uh, just enough, right? Just good enough. But not more than that, right? At 40 degrees, when you have a fever, this is where your body is really at the top of its performance. Uh, yeah? Do different enzymes have different optimum? Yes, they do. They do. So some enzymes, there are a few that are at 35, for instance. So this is really an average, huh? 40 degrees. So some are even be, uh, be, uh, beyond 40 degrees. But 40 degrees, usually most enzymes are around 40 degrees. But this is, uh, yeah, <laughs> so there's also heterogeneity in the optima, of course. <laughs> but yeah, so you see the point, right? Yep. But then uh, why do we feel uh, sick and weak and without energy and clearly not at optimal uh, shape when we have uh, 40 degrees? Fever? Yeah, so actually, so you're basically your brain is uh, shut down, right? So you want to sleep. It's probably a good idea for your body to uh, recover, right? But it's because you don't sense your metabolism, right? And you don't sense your immune system. At 40 degrees, your immune system is really at the best of its performance, at its possible performance. And so when you have fever, you feel tired indeed. You feel like you're not very performant as a human uh, body. <laughs> but actually, you are very performant. Your metabolism is highly performant, uh, and your immune system is highly performant. So when you have fever, when you switch from 37 to 38 degrees, for instance, you actually boost your immune system. 
And this is actually the best uh, news. When you, when you feel that you have fever, that means that your body is reacting to a pathogen. That's when you don't have fever, but it's, you should be worried, right? <laughs> because if you feel like you are, you've been infected by a pathogen and you don't have fever, that means that your immune system is not reacting. So you could also almost uh, reverse the, the vision on this. So you see the, the message here is super simple, right? So that means that at 37 degrees, so at, uh, let's say, normal temperature, we are not at maximal performance, we are not at optimal performance, we are beyond, we are sub-optimal, we are below the optimum of performance. But this is exactly like this, is to have enough room to manage fluctuation, a fluctuation in a pathogen, for instance. But that also means that uh, we can, I mean, as human beings or as uh, biological systems, we can allow performance, but it's really allow performance, <laughs> only three days, right? Uh, after three days, it's, uh, it's uh, little, huh? uh, 40 degrees. Huh? At 40 degrees, your proteins are so efficient, so uh, like working so hard, that actually they are uh, denaturating themselves. They are unfolding, basically. And then they don't work anymore, and forever, right? So you, that's, uh, that's why you don't want to be at fever for too long as well. <laughs> it's, a, it's a molecular burnout, huh? that's what I, I call it. It's exactly that, right? So you're really weakening the, the system by being too performed. So that's the take home message from body temperature, but you see again, huh? You increase robustness by taking a lot more uh, you know, margin, like a lot more uh, room. So I have another example, that's my favorite one, photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, so you know photosynthesis, that's the most important uh, biological uh, mechanism on Earth. That's what is uh, converting a gas, CO2, into uh, carbon fibers. So if you take a plant, it's just a bunch of uh, carbon fibers. Huh? So this exists, photosynthesis exists, um, as, or has been existing for the past 3.8 billion years. 3.8 billion years. This is an extremely old uh, metabolic uh, process. And this is feeding almost all the ecosystems on Earth. This is our link to the sun, huh, basically. The yield of photosynthesis, the energy yield of photosynthesis is less than 1%. So when we measure it in the field, we find 0.3 to 0.8 percent. So it's a very, very small yield, very small yield. So I mean, that yield, what does that mean? It's the difference in energy between the solar energy that uh, arrives on the leaf and the metabolic energy that comes out of the leaf, if you want. So if I say it in a different way, uh, plants are wasting 99 percent of the solar energy. So that's not performant, right? It's not efficient. <laughs> And you see here, I've put some uh, solar panels. Uh, solar panels, so we, we make solar panels, uh, we've been making uh, solar panels for the past uh, 50 years, and we've increased the efficiency of solar panels, and now we're at uh, 15%, 15%. So in 50 years, humans, we do 15%, 3.8 billion years, less than 1%. What's going on? <laughs> Why did photosynthesis, photosynthesis did not get optimized during all this time, right? There was a lot of time to optimize. So we have the answer to that, to that question, and that's something that you should uh, immediately notice on this image, is that solar panels are black and plants are green. So plants do not have the right color. They should be black, right? If you want to absorb the light, uh, the solar light, you need to be black. That's the black that is uh, absorbing all the wavelengths of the rainbow, right? So if they are green, that means that plants are absorbing the red, the blue, so the extreme of the rainbow, and they are reflecting all the center of the rainbow, right? And that's why they are green, right? Because they are reflecting the green light, if you want. So the question is, why are plants green? And so we have the answer, and it's a recent finding. I mean, it's a recent uh, conclusion, let's say. That's uh, three years ago, about. Uh, and so it, this is um, quantum physics, so I won't be able to go into uh, full details. But I can give you just the overall message. Uh, in that paper, they showed that if you want photosynthesis to be very efficient, very performant, you need to have a flux of uh, photons, so light particles, that are really regular. So you need to have really, it's like a, you know, like a Charlie Chaplin uh, movie, right? So <laughs> you need to have uh, something um, very irregular, like uh, in a chain or something. Uh, but actually, that's not what happens in uh, real life, right? Uh, light is fluctuating all the time. There are these clouds uh, between the morning, the afternoon, the angle of the light is changing, so the light is fluctuating all the time. And inside the cells, they are also fluctuating. Cells are dividing, they are dying, uh, proteins are polymerizing, they are depolymerizing, so all this is very fluctuating. So there's a lot of fluctuation inside, there's a lot of fluctuation outside. 
what is the solution in a fluctuating world. But that article is saying that for, for photosynthesis, there's only one solution. It's to absorb in the red, and it's to absorb in the blue, and the two peaks of absorption need to be away from one another to allow fluctuation. Actually, it's a little bit like this. Red, blue, to allow fluctuation in the light or in biology. So if, if I say differently, the question was, why are plants green? And the answer, to manage fluctuations and only to manage fluctuations. It's never a question of performance. And you see, for 3.8 billion years, it's been like this. So there is a take-home message for us. Um, that's it's probably uh, something to, to think about. So I just, I just gave you two examples. Yep. Uh, in this example, so if you stop the solar panels, like, they don't manage quite well. They don't perform quite well on fluctuations. <coughs> so you cannot so solar panels, they, they, do, they, uh, they, they will manage because they don't have the same um, protocol as the plants, right? So they do absorb the light and they have a better yield. But if you make the entire life cycle of a solar panel uh, and the fact that it's only absorbing light to make energy, and this is actually doing a lot more than just uh, uh, producing, uh, I mean, producing energy, it's also producing a lot of uh, well, stuff, basically the entire <laughs> green world that we are in. Uh, now, this actually is, is working in the short term. So you have 15% yield in the short term, but if you include all the energy that you need to build the solar panels, to repair them, to recycle them, to, uh, be, to do all this, actually, you will probably get closer to uh, minus 1%. It's just because here we are uh, in a very short term window, in the stuck in the performance range. Um, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have solar panels, huh, of course, huh, they're, they're useful. <laughs> but it's just, uh, here there's a philosophical message that is much stronger than the one from the solar panels, right? if you see what I mean. So this is the way to live uh, a fluctuating world. And so this is the example of uh, body temperature uh, photosynthesis, but there are many more. Uh, and it's always the same thing, right? So you have basically all these counter performances that are, as I said, adding uh, uh, oil in the wheel and uh, increasing the adaptability of the system, and so increasing its robustness. So that's what really is at the core of living systems. Robustness built against performance. So this is a lesson for us, right? Because now if we identify that performance is the cause of many of our problems in, so in, uh, in social systems and in ecological systems, maybe we need to, to learn from this. So I'm going to uh, dig into this with you, with this curve that is basically uh, summarizing uh, everything I've been telling you uh, so far. So if you look at, uh, this is basically a sort of a view on uh, human progress, right? can say it like this. So human progress has been uh, stuck with the idea that we need to increase performance. So when you look at the history of humanity, it's been an increase in efficacy and an increase in efficiency, especially during the, I mean, since the Neolithic age, huh? uh, 10,000 years ago, when we start with agriculture, domestication, uh, breeding and everything. Uh, then uh, Renaissance, I won't go through the whole history, but if you can uh, easily spot uh, points where we increased efficacy, increased efficiency. And so what happens now uh, in 2023, let's say, <laughs> is that we realize that the more we go into performance, the more the viability on Earth is threatened. So it's, it's not going to go uh, so well, right? So if we <laughs> keep on going with performance, huh? uh, I, I can refer to uh, the Meadows report, I mean, uh, the limits to growth, I mean, and many other reports, we know that this is uh, uh, not a viable trajectory. Huh? So the question is, what is progress in the 21st century? And I like to use the word progress huh, because I think it's uh, an operational word. Actually. So what is the definition of progress in the 21st century? The, the, the progress in the 21st century, you just have to change the axis. In the 21st century, in a century that is going to be more turbulent, with more changes, we'll have to switch axis and to increase robustness. It's super basic, right? Because robustness is the operational answer to fluctuations. And so to do this, we'll have to go against performance, exactly like living beings, simply because it's impossible to be very performant and very robust. It's physically impossible. Huh? These are two opposing uh, factors. You can't be very performant and very robust. So in a fluctuating world, it's better to be more robust. If you are very performant, you're really in a narrow uh, way. And if the world is changing all the time, you won't get uh, anywhere. So the question, of course, is uh, are we there yet? <laughs> Have we started to shift from performance to robustness? So if you uh, talk to investors, 
you will probably won't get the idea that we have moved to robustness, right? Investors, they're very much still stuck to performance. If you talk to uh, McKinsey, uh, Total, Shell, Exxon, still the same, right? They're still into performance. Even consumers, right? So consumers, they want cheap goods uh, as fast as possible. That's, again, uh, performance, right? Politics, the same. Huh? Uh, if you listen to Emmanuel Macron's uh, <laughs> discourse, he's uh, saying uh, the word uh, efficacité pretty much uh, every day. Huh? So uh, there's a lot of yeah, performance in the world. But I want to uh, focus on the things that have already switched to robustness and to show you that actually it's growing and it's growing super fast. So here are some examples. So agriculture. So this is intensive agriculture. So that's the world of performance, right? So where you put uh, the best uh, variety on the field and you uh, somewhat ignore or uh, avoid fluctuation by putting uh, irrigation, fertilizers and pesticides. And by doing this you have the best yield but the cost is uh, pollutions, uh, soil desertification and uh, farmers uh, alienation, um, suicide, I mean uh, all of uh, many toxic uh, outcome of intensive agriculture. So what is the robust version of agriculture? Of course, it's agroecology, right? Agroecology, and it's all in its, in its uh, diversity, agroforestry, uh, permaculture, uh, co-culture. Uh, and so here is one example. So if, if you have the, the same field, the same farmer, and you want that system to become more robust, what you can do, level one of agroecology, is instead of sowing the best variety, you sow uh, 20 different varieties of uh, wheat in this case. 20 different varieties. So in this case, you will get a little bit less yield because you haven't put the best variety. But what happens here is that you, these different uh, wheat uh, are going to uh, talk to each other, right? They're going to communicate. They're going to exchange nutrients. They're going to exchange uh, signals. And that field that is now with a lot more biodiversity is going to become more resistant to drought and more resistant to pathogens just because you've increased the diversity. It's emerging from the interactions in the field. And so this is robustness, right? Th now the field is a bit more autonomous. Doesn't need uh, all that oil to make, uh, you know, like uh, pesticides, fertilizer, uh, irrigation. So this is known, huh? this, is, uh, this is a fact. Huh? This is uh, demonstrated in uh, all over the, the world, actually, uh, in uh, labs, uh, it really works. But what's more interesting, I think, is that actually we are shifting in society as well. So this is, these are the, the surface area of wheat uh, grown as uh, mixed varieties, like this with 20 or so uh, different varieties. You see in 2010, uh, this was uh, about 5% of the surface of the land that was uh, covered with uh, mixed varieties. And you see in 2020, so if you go in the south of France, like around uh, Montpellier, uh, it's 40%, 4-0, 40%. Eh? 40%. And this is between 2010 and 2020. So this is super fast, right? It's not much actually. I mean, the, the difference is like five to ten percent, but no, not much more. And also, uh, something to um, to think about is in uh, intensive agriculture, the focus is on the yield uh, of grains, but we completely forget about the yield in biomass, <coughs> like the the straw, the leaves, the roots. And often in uh, in uh, agroecology, we don't want to only produce grains. We also want to produce biomass to refeed the soil to maintain the agrometry of the soil. So it's a lot more. Uh, so if you take the total yield, actually it's higher <laughs> in, uh, in these um, this systems. So this switch from performance to robustness, it's not a transition. It's not a bifurcation. It's not a redirection. It's an inversion. <laughs> it's an inversion. We are going to do the opposite of what we were doing before. So this is for agriculture. So in the world of performance, we used to use ecosystems to increase production. In the world of robustness, we ask the opposite question. How production can feed ecosystems? See, it's the opposite. So in the world of performance, it's a very narrow-minded, uh, it's, it's a world of uh, poor interactions, right? It's only one ob small objective and just uh, go like this. Whereas here, uh, in the world of robustness, when you're a farmer that is doing uh, agroecology, not only you produce grains, but you also produce biomass, you produce uh, auxiliary insects, you maintain the agrometry of your soil, you exchange your mixed varieties with your neighbors, so you mix your mixed varieties. So it's a, it's a world of the rich interactions, right? You diversify your interactions. And that's, of course, much more robust, right? Because your field is much more autonomous now. So that's for agriculture. So there are other examples. So uh, for goods, so uh, this is the world of bioeconomy. 
So if I take uh, yeah, the, the example of the lithium, lithium uh, batteries, so these are uh, well, very efficient uh, batteries, but you know that lithium, uh, the extraction of lithium is uh, problematic. There's also cobalt in there that is coming from uh, Congo mines with uh, kids involved. And it's super toxic uh, technology in some ways. So uh, what we want to do is to get rid of all this, right? So we don't want to keep the, the lithium going on, right? Uh, even though it's like uh, shown as the, you know, renewable energy, the new thing. No, actually, it's probably a bad idea to keep uh, doing uh, all this lithium, right? So what we want to do is to, for instance, do this. So this is a company, it's in uh, Sweden, and they found a way to make uh, batteries that are made of uh, lignin. And lignin is the second mo most abundant uh, biomolecule on Earth. That's what you find in wood. Huh? In wood, you find uh, cellulose and uh, lignin. So when you make uh, paper out of wood, you, uh, you take wood, you extract the cellulose to make uh, paper, and then you have a waste that is called lignin. And so what they found is that you can make films of uh, lignin, and those films of lignin, they are storing electricity. And so now you have batteries that are able to store electricity. So of course, it's not as performant as lithium. Huh? Those batteries are huge. You can't put them on a car. Right? <laughs> they are really too big. <laughs> they are not as efficient, but they are biodegradable and they are uh, completely uh, well. They, do, they don't have any impact, or almost no impact, uh, on the on the ecosystems. And so you see, this is where I want to insist on this word: recarbonization of the economy. You know, we hear a lot in the media: we need to decarbonize the economy. But that's actually the last thing we want to do. Right? We don't want to decarbonize the economy. We want to stop burning carbon. So we want to stop the combustion of carbon. <laughs> That's what we want to do. We don't want to burn uh, oil, uh, but we don't want to burn uh, wood. We don't want to uh, burn the biofuels. So that's OK. Yeah, that I will take. But we don't want to decarbonize the economy. We want to recarbonize the economy. That's the only way we are going to replace all the metals that are replacing the oil right now. Right? So we want to change all this uh, oil, all these metals with bio-based mo mo molecules. That's the future. And there are many solutions. Huh? So this is uh, for uh, batteries, but there are examples for paint. Now we can do paints with uh, uh, bio-based uh, molecules that are completely biodegradable. We can store uh, data on, uh, in uh, DNA. I mean, there are many, many examples, right? So the world of bioeconomy, that's, that's this one. And this is, again, an inversion from performance to, uh, to robustness. It's the inversion between time and matter. So when you switch to bioeconomy, actually what you do is that in the world of performance, you used to use matter to save time. So that's basically you, uh, you burn uh, kerosene to take a uh, flight, right? That's efficient, and you burn a lot of matter to save time. But actually in the world of robustness, it's the opposite. You want to use time to save matter. That's the world of bioeconomy. So you, you have to wait for the plants to grow. <laughs> the fungi to digest the plants, the bacteria to do their thing. Uh, so this is going to take more time. That's by the world of bioeconomy. So it's less performant, but it's more robust because it's completely circular, really circular. If you don't do that, that's never circular. Right? This has to <laughs> the recarbonization of the economy. That's the only way to be fully circular. OK, another uh, idea is uh, something that you see in your everyday life, and that I see as well, is the rise of the all reparable. So you know, when uh, you are in the world of performance, you want to buy things or you want to produce things that are uh, quick fix, easy, and that you can, uh, you know, can throw away because there's something else that is about the same, very cheap, that you can buy. And then, uh, you know, it's the shine model eh, for, for, uh, for clothes, eh, for instance. That's the world of performance, right? Where you waste a lot of uh, material. Eh? The all repairable, it's the opposite. You, when you buy an object, uh, you, it has to be repairable for life. <laughs> And even you have to transmit it to your uh, kids, right? So it's really long, <laughs> long lived. And so there are many examples of this thing that we are, we, I mean, we are shifting towards the all repairable. So you can think in constructions. Uh, we are going away from uh, the very performing um, uh, tools, let's say, like the uh, concrete. I mean, all these things that are using a lot of energy and a, a lot of matter. So we are using this wood, earth, straws. These are local products that are less performant than some of the high performance, uh, you know, like uh, super isolating uh, oil-based uh, materials. But those ones, what's the robustness is mostly uh, social because this is quite easy to build a house in uh, raw earth, in wood or straw. And so that means that you can share the protocols. That means that you can do uh, social insertion with this type of uh, tool. So this is robust socially, essentially. 
Uh, if you look at uh, fair phones, that's a very anecdotal example, but uh, this is a phone that you can repair to some extent, and not everything, but a little bit. That's the first step towards regaining your autonomy on your object. And the same goes for the repair shops for bikes or anything else, actually. So this is really uh, rising now. And actually, if you take a step back, uh, we are quitting the economy of uh, ownership of uh, property to go to the economy of uh, usage, of uh, functionality, right? But that's robust usage economy, functionality economy. Right? Uh, and so this is another inversion. That's the inversion of what we ask engineers to do. So in the world of performance, we were asking uh, engineers to increase performance, right? They're actually at the <laughs> forefront of performance engineers, right? Engineers are the ones that are pushing for more performance through distant technical delegation. That's what uh, engineers are doing in the world of performance. In the world of robustness, it's exactly the same knowledge. It's the same science. It's the same math. It's the same physics, same biology. It's all the same. Mm -hmm. It's just the sense of technology that is changing. In the world of robustness, you develop techno-diverse solutions, and you aim at giving autonomy to citizens. To see, again, it's the opposite, right? So instead of having one dominant technology that is uh, destroying all the previous ones that were less performant, so by the way, that's the technophobia is here. Huh? The world of performance is the one that is technophobic. You go to a world where you preserve a lot of different technology, an array of different technology. So that's technophilic, really technophilic. <laughs> but you only sort them based on their robustness. If they're not robust, you don't maintain them. If they're robust, you maintain them. And the goal is to uh, make citizens more autonomous. So autonomous uh, doesn't mean uh, individually. Huh? It has to be collective at the level of a village, of a city, of a region, of a country, but not much more than that, right? Obviously. Huh? So it, uh, it has to be, uh, re you relocalize the know-all in, in some ways. Okay, I'm going to finish with uh, organizations. So in uh, organization, it's the same. The switch from uh, performance to robustness uh, changes a lot of things. So for instance, in schools, so in the world of performance, uh, schools were teaching uh, competition and performance. You know, it's like uh, having a note on your uh, copy, uh, for instance, or like uh, the exams or the, yeah, the concours and all this, right? So that's producing a lot of competition, a lot of uh, burnout. <laughs> both on the teacher's front or on the student's front. Huh? So uh, in the world of robustness, we're going to switch to the schools of cooperation. <coughs> so it's a very different type of school. So in those schools, the students are teaching uh, each other. And the students are uh, looking for the information themselves. So that means that there's a lot of gaps in the program, if you want to, so there's actually no real program. But actually what happens here is that those kids that are uh, looking for the information, uh, you know that when you look for your, yourself for the information, it's for life then. Huh? If you've discovered something yourself, you're going to save it in your brain forever, right? But that's actually very robust in terms of uh, learning. And you also get a lot of recognition. In the world of performance, you have recognition when the teacher is giving you a good grade, which is a bit poor huh, as a recognition. In the world of robustness, you get recognition when you discover something and you explain it to your uh, fellow uh, comrades, <laughs> right? So it's it's much more uh, it much more well it's, it's a lot more recognition, right? And you know recognition is a primary uh, human need, huh? like food. Huh? We all need recognition huh? every day, and so this is a school where you get recognition every day. And so the examples huh, there are many. Huh, uh, Ecole Frenet, uh, the school uh, Frenet Montessori, but in uh, Finland it's Strömberg. Uh, I mean there are many many examples of this. So it's, it's also uh, growing a lot, right? Okay, and so maybe another example for uh, um, uh, organizations. So there's a lot more uh, examples like this of organizations that uh, have reached a level of burnout that was not acceptable anymore, if you want. <laughs> so they really reached the end of uh, you know burnout uh, pandemic, if you want. And so, for instance, uh, Birdsorg, so that's a co um, uh, collective of uh, nurses that decided to have to, to drop the commercial goals. So that's typically a good art law, right? So when you don't have any commercial goals, actually, it opens your, uh, your way to uh, many other, other solutions, let's say. They have a modul modular organization, they have self-governance. So all this is much less efficient than an efficient organization, of course, because it's much more heterogeneous, more, more slow, uh, all this, redundant, etc. But actually, this type of um, organizations, actually, they are more respectful to the patients. The patients become more autonomous, 
And actually, the, the nice thing with it is that the nurse, they regain the sense of their job. They know why they're doing this. And at the state level, actually, you, they, the state is losing less money, simply because there are less burnouts. Um, so it's uh, as simple as this one. And so there's another example. It's cooperative uh, housing. Cooperative housing. So these are citizens. Uh, they, uh, they get together and they want to build a house with uh, private uh, parts and, uh, well, shared parts. And so usually it takes five years for the project to go to uh, fruition. So that's, very, that's much less uh, performant than uh, when you uh, go to your real estate agent and you buy uh, an apartment or you rent an apartment, right? It's uh, much slower, <laughs> but it's more robust because now you have um, a living uh, conditions where you know your neighbors, you have uh, extra room in your uh, apartment because you have an extra uh, friend's room, you have a floor for kids, you have uh, I mean, uh, a garden with, uh, where, where you can grow some uh, fruits and vegetables. And often it goes beyond the habitat, it goes towards the neighborhood as well. So the, these people usually they take care of their neighbors as well, or their like, uh, neighborhood as well. So it's super robust uh, in terms of in a city, right, to have this type of uh, cooperative housing. But you see it's less performant, right? It takes more time. And also, you, uh, it's a school of cooperation in itself, right? Because in those type of cooperative uh, housing, you need to uh, be able to solve conflicts. Because, of course, you have people who are like, you know, vocal right, about uh, what they want and everything. So all this yeah, needs some uh, training. Right? OK, so that's basically the take-home message that I wanted. So it's very simple, right? The, it's uh, in one sentence, we are entering a century. We are going to increase the fluctuation in a world that is increasing its fluctuation performance is the last thing you want to do. You want to do robustness, exactly like living beings. And so living beings is providing a narrative for robustness. That's all they're doing, right, in some ways for us, right? They are showing us that it's possible to have a life, a robust life, in a fluctuating world. And uh, this is the... So uh, maybe one extra slide. Sorry, I, I, had, I did this as well. Just to uh, give you a bit of a uh, method as well. Not, uh, not only a concept, but also a method. To me, we need to start with robustness. <laughs> robustness is the first thing to ask. So if you have a project, uh, you might want to say, uh, well, I want it to be sober. I want to have the least amount of impact possible. If you do this, you might be trapped again into performance. Maybe you will go for energy efficiency, a lot of rebound effect, and in the end, you will not be more sober. Right? So what you want to do is to reverse this pyramid, right? So when we write projects, when we design projects, this is the mental image we have, right? So the, basic, the basics, let's say, is that it has to be viable from the economical point of view, right? So we first think that's the foundation of a project, <coughs> the economy. If the economy is under control, then we can have a social model on this, right? And if we have a social model, then we can take care of nature. That's pretty much the, the way we think about uh, our projects right now, huh? when I say we uh, globally. Huh? So of course, this is uh, it's a dead end huh? This, huh? in a fluctuating world. So in a fluctuating world, you want to do this just exactly the, the, uh, the inverse, right? So you want to realize that any project is rooted in nature. So you have to take care of nature. That's the first thing that your project needs to uh, take care of the health of uh, natural systems. If your project is taking care of natural systems, then this is going to produce social <coughs> interactions, obviously. And if you produce so social interactions, this is going to generate economic models. And those economic models will be robust because they are built on a robust social system that is built on a robust natural system. So see, it's an inversion again, right? But it's often we don't think uh, like this, right? But, it's, but this, is the <laughs> this is the way to go. And I'm going to finish really with uh, lessons from the Kogis. So these are Indians from uh, Colombia. Maybe uh, some of you uh, know them, right? They, are, they live uh, 3,000 years, I mean 3,000 meters uh, above sea. They, they, have, uh, they live on the mountain, basically, and the top part is uh, pretty high. There's an uh, ice cap on top. Uh, and so these, these people actually, these are uh, pre-Columbian people. They've been around for 4,000 years. So uh, this is a robust population, if you want. Right? They went through a lot of fluctuations, especially during the Colombian uh, years, let's say. And they came to France uh, like uh, five years ago, and they also came back uh, a, few, a few weeks ago, actually. And when they arrived in France for the first time, they said this. They said this to us. They said, how do you learn? How do you learn? Because here, for them, the, the pyramid I was showing earlier, it, that's their way to do it, right? Everything is rooted in nature, right? 
And so when they arrived in Paris, uh, in a Roissy, in a CDG, right, uh, where you see all this concrete, all these planes, I mean, there's no trace of nature, they say, but how do you learn, right? <laughs> where, where, where is your link to nature, right? Where, where is your foundation? You've lost it. And uh, so they also asked another question, which I think is super powerful, is uh, where are your Indians? Where are your Indians? That's also <laughs> super powerful, I think. Okay, so I'll stop here. So there's a number of books here that are in French, though, so I don't think it's <laughs> so useful. But uh, I, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, David, I'll send you the, I've recorded a few uh, videos in English. So maybe that will be uh, more useful, like short videos to uh, get, get the take-home message. Um, and so now, we're ready for the questions. <laughs> Thank you.